thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Understanding Your Employer Brand, How It Affects Recruitment, Retention, and Engagement. Our presenter today is Jason Lichney, who is the Marketing and Employment Branding Manager here at PPS Consulting, HR Consulting. Please note that all attendees are in listen-only mode to avoid interruptions to the session, and you can submit your questions through the questions panel in your webinar dashboard. We'll make every effort to address your questions at the end of the presentation as time allows. Today's presentation is available on the CPS HR website and as a handout in your webinar dashboard. We'll forward a link to the recording and slide deck to all of today's attendees as soon as it's available. And now, let's get started. Jason? Hello, everybody. I'm uh, glad to be given the privilege to um, present this webinar on understanding your employer brand and um, how, it how it affects recruitment, retention, and engagement. Um, quickly, just a little introduction about myself. Um, I have about 15 years of experience and bring a passion of marketing for the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Founded and managed the growth of multiple organizations, recognized on the Inc. 500 fastest growing companies list. I've served as director of marketing for nonprofit financial services trade associations. I have a Bachelor's of Science in Operations Research from Cornell University and a Master's degree also from Cornell in Marketing and Analytics. And currently with CPSHR, I am the Marketing and Employment Branding Manager, and I help public agencies brand their organization to uh, attract top talent. And if you haven't already, please reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, you can just look up my name. I'll have it at the end too. So quickly, questions that we're looking to answer today. Um, what's an employer brand? Why should I create one uh, for my organization? Or And what, what a great employer brand um, can do for your organization? So first and foremost, an employer brand is kind of the way in which organizations differentiate themselves in the labor market that enables them to recruit, retain, and engage the right people. A strong employer brand helps businesses compete for the best talent and establish credibility, and it should connect with an organization's values and has to run consistently through your approach to people management. Now, branding is sort of one of those words that people have different perceptions of, so I want to delve into that a little bit. And if you wouldn't mind, in the comments field, just answer the question, um, what what do you think a brand is? And we'll wait about two minutes, but just throw, throw out answers for me. Right. What do you think a brand is? Right into the questions panel in your webinar dashboard. Okay, somebody says they think it's the logo and the colors. More people saying that, um, okay. Um, how you're perceived at large, employer story, culture. Style guide. Companies culture, style guide, reputation. Okay, so in, in order to kind of talk about brand, I want to pull up a private sector example. And one of, one of my personal favorite companies is Nike. And talk about the logo of Nike, and we'll, we'll bring this back to, to public sector in a second, so bear with me. Um, but the Nike swoosh, a lot of people don't know that it was designed by a Portland State University graphic design student. Her name was Carolyn Davison in 1971. And she was paid $35 to design, to design this logo. She didn't use any focus groups. It wasn't a collaborative design process. You know, a lot of our organizations, we have these huge processes to figure out what the, the emblem is or what the colors should be. And in Nike's case, Phil Knight gave her 35 bucks, and this is what she came up with, right? And near, nearly 50 years later, that Nike swoosh is still what we think of. A lot of people think of as Nike's brand, right? We think of this, this logo. The logo and color scheme are just reinforcement that the organization exists. It's like your name, right? Your name is not who you are as an individual. It's just how someone would refer to you, right? And 
that logo represents something else. It's just like a music note represents the sound or a flag represents the national culture. The goal is to create a connection between the static logo and something a lot bigger to create an emotional trigger. So the logo or symbol doesn't create any connection to anything without context, right, through an amplified message. And we can do that through social media, through our website, through just everything that we do. That messaging is what ends up building the brand and the perception. And, um, and in the context of Nike, so this was one of their first advertisements that, that they put out there. And if you look at this poster, and I know you can't read the text, I'll, I'll read it to you in a second. But if, if you look at this poster, it's just really ordinary, right? It looks like some guys running in the Pacific Northwest, just down some random street that really anyone can do. There's nothing particularly special about it. Um, and the text goes in to say there is no finish line. Sooner or later, the serious runner goes through a special, very personal experience that is known, um, that is unknown to most people. Some call it euphoria. Others say it's a new kind of mystical experience that propels you into an elevated state of consciousness. And there's a lot of words here. Um, but it goes on to say a flash of joy, a sense of floating as you run. So you're getting some visualization. The experience is unique to each of us. And when it happens, you break through a barrier that separates you from casual runners forever. And from that point on, there is no finish line. You run for your life. You begin to be addicted to what running gives you. We at Nike understand that feeling. There's no finish line for us either. We will never stop trying to excel to produce running shoes that are better and better every year. Beating the competition is relatively easy, but beating yourself is a never-ending commitment. And that last line is sort of, to me, what has become Nike's brand, right? It's not it's about self-empowerment. Um, you feel inspired, you feel emotion, Nike selling a better version of yourself, not necessarily a shoe. And they're defined by their culture of personal improvement and empowerment. So that message, that was in 1970-something. And that message today, these are recent social media posts from Nike. And you can see it's the same message. I train my absolute hardest and challenge myself with every day, no matter what's coming. And don't forget to be the best you. It's the same, it's the same brand. Now the color's different. The, the, the logo is slightly different in the top left. The, the people are different, right? It's more, more diverse. The clothes are different, but the message is the same. And as we look at, you know, uh, uh, one of the, one of the answers to what is a brand mentions culture, your organizational brand starts with your culture, right? And as, as we talk about employment branding in particular, we already innately in our organizations have an employer brand because we all have employees and we all have experiences working for our organization. So, as as we look into that, that culture is pivotal is pivotal in employer branding. And so we have we have to understand what what is our organizational culture. And I always love these graphics of icebergs because you get the the portion of the iceberg underneath the water that's always so much bigger than than what we see on top. And and the stuff above the water are things like, you know, the mission statements and the things we're putting out online that are very public and, um, and, and visible, you know, the, the goals and the, and the shared values and policies and, and things of that nature. But then underneath there, we've got employee feelings and social norms and unwritten rules and, uh, and different values and perceptions and, all of those, all of those interactions, tradition. And organizational culture has, has evolved. So when we talk about the overar overarching organizational culture, we think about things like strategy, vision, mission, goals. And then there's a the supervisory culture. And I always love uh, the movie Office Space, but um, most of us have had the bosses that are angry at you for asking too many stupid questions and then angry at you for, for not taking 
matters into your own hands. And how your supervisor treats you or how a supervisor treats employees creates a, a massive effect on, on your organizational culture, right? So it's the management style and the unwritten rules and the procedures and policies and perception of, of your supervisor. There's also team culture, right? So that team culture is sort of evolving. And, and before it was just supervisory and, uh, and organization, but now it, one of the quotes was that people don't quit uh, jobs, they quit bosses. And I'm sure most have heard of that quote. Now it's evolving. People don't quit jobs, they quit teams. And the team culture has a lot to play in it. So we're talking here norms and personalities and motivations and commitment and work effort. And team culture can be very different, right? It can be uh, kind of the, the standard leader and, and everybody sitting around in the room or it can be sort of more collaborative and fun and interaction and and building this feeling of work family uh, type of an atmosphere. And it can also uh, build resentments, right? Where if you have different different players within a team where one is doing uh, a lot of the work and one might not know what they're doing and and, uh, and one's saying uh, they're gonna help but doesn't and the other one, you know, kind of disappears and doesn't show up till the very end. The, the, the interaction of the team itself um, can create that work atmosphere. And each one of these are very micro and individualistic to, to people within your organization. So, you know, overall, we look at how that culture in that organization is how it makes me feel, right? How it, it connects me uh, to the organization. And at the end, it's an emotional connection. Um, there was a novel that I was reading, or a book that I was reading, a uh, marketing book, discussing the premise of why people make purchase decisions and, and even buy in to anything. And Apple is a good example of that because Apple has almost a cult following, right? And, and it's sort of this very emotional connection to this, to this company where you want to buy the next Apple, the next iPhone or whatever, um, just because of the culture of Apple. And so you make the decision emotionally to buy. And if you look at Apple's ads, they're all about sort of empowerment and the beautiful photography. Really, what's in that product, the technology behind it is an afterthought. And so we make the decision to buy emotionally. And we use the factual data to justify a decision that we already made, right? And so culture is a way to create that emotional connection to want to work for an organization. And the rest of the aspects, salary, benefits, um, actual job function, are the details that help you uh, help you rationalize that decision to work within uh, that organization. So we do a little exercise in this. Bear with me because we're going to try to keep up with all the all the responses. And I'll try to stay as interactive as possible here. Um, but we're going to do an exercise to build a brand, an employer brand experience statement. And so what what I want everyone to do is sort of first answer, uh, what word or phrase describes the mission of your organization? Why does your organization exist? Wait a few seconds here. Okay, I see them coming in. We've got service, safety, fire protection, serve the public, service, Protecting environment, people, service, more fire protection, educate, to serve and protect. Sounds like we've got some public safety folks on the line. Um, train law enforcement professionals, educate, provide service to the public. So being 
public sector, it's not surprising that we see so many that are um, there for the purpose of service. And, okay, so the next question, and if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you have a sheet of paper, write down sort of what what you stated there um, to help you piece it together at the end. The next question is, what are the biggest perks or benefits from your organization or job? And um, examples of this are stability, pay, amazing health care, great pension, training, development, special planning, flexibility. But whatever comes to mind for you personally, and, and not really thinking at an abstract level, but. Okay, and we've got stability, benefits in healthcare, flexible benefits, good team, retirement, PERS, um, pension, location, pension, <laughs> uh, diversity, stability, pension, benefits and pension, awesome CEO. Um, flexibility and team environment, work environment. Okay, there cool. Means. So if, if, even if you didn't comment, write it down on a sheet of paper. So we're gonna use those, we're gonna use those things in a second. The concept of mission statement, a lot of us, a lot of our, well all of our organizations have a mission statement and I find it, mission statements very interesting um, because a lot of us remember them when we're in an interview <laughs> and quote, quoting the mission statement potentially um, to show that we did our research on an organization. Uh, we, we, you know, as we're researching the company, we, we learn it or, or organization, but then sometime in our career, we no longer remember necessarily verbatim what that mission statement is, right? We may have a overarching concept or, or, or have an understanding of that mission statement, but I would venture to say if I asked everybody to write their mission, which I'm not going to, but if I asked you to write your mission statement verbatim, you'd probably have to pull up the website for your organization to see what it was. And it's interesting to me because we struggle around individual, as we create these mission statements, again, it's focus groups and struggling around individual words and do we use this word or that word or how do we convey everything with the perspective that in a year, our employees don't really know what it is and, and can't articulate it clearly. And so my contention is that mission statement, we should be really looking at our employer brand experience statement more so. And that's sort of the tangible, how do I want my employees to, to feel when they work for my organization? What, what lasting impression is my organization leaving on them and why are they coming back to work every day? Because at the end of the day, you know, we work eight to 10 hours a day and uh, you know, in a in a 24 hour period when you're sleeping, let's say eight hours, and you're working eight hours, there's only eight left to not be at work, right? And some of that time you're getting ready for work or coming home from work, so you you're giving only about 30 percent of your life is with your loved ones and your family, and the rest are sleeping or at work, and so. As an employer, I feel that we have a responsibility to give that experience that that makes people want to be there because you're you're sacrificing so much to be um, to be serving the, the public sector. So part of that building that employee uh, brand experience statement is taking those things, the mission and the benefit, and also adding one more part. And what I'd like you to do is kind of, I'm gonna give you a scenario where you just woke up in the morning and your alarm clock goes off and the first, the first thought in your head is, is your job and, and your organization. 
what's the first word that pops up? And if you mind, put it on, type it in. If you don't, if you don't feel comfortable typing it in, then just write it down on a sheet of paper. But um, first word that pops up. Workload. <laughs> that one came in right away. Depends on the day. Personal issue. Personnel issues. Sorry. No. No. Same. Analytical. Busy, no. Important, urgent, communication, recruitment, coffee. I like this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Calendar. Does not grow their own. Does not grow their own. Too much free food. <laughs> Get organized email. Bullying. Impact. Okay. Too much work. Busy. All right. We'll, we'll stop it off there. So. You know, we can talk about the employer brand experience and kind of what it feels like. Mm -hmm. And then these are examples of very personal feelings, right? Bullying, busy, uh, personnel issues. These are things that are literally weighing on that person's mind, right? It's, it, it's causing you to lose sleep, literally. Um, and, and some of those things are the things that have to be addressed during creating that culture, right? And if, if those are the first things on, on, uh, on your mind, then, then there's probably something there that, that needs to be done. But we come to creating that employer brand experience statement. How that works is saying something like, at CPS, CPS HR Consulting, we, and this would be the first question that we answered, kind of what our mission is. We, we serve public agencies and help with organizational performance, right? That would be kind of what, what our premise is. And I, I don't even know the mission statement verbatim. So that's just, you know, that's, that's the feeling that I get from it. We make our employees feel, and in this case, you know, feel stable, um, you know, feel part of a team. These were kind of things that, that were thrown out. Uh, <laughs> you know, feel challenged, um, you have words like analytical. And we help them contribute to the greater good in whatever location. We reinforce our commitment to our employees by offering, again, stability, flexible benefits, retirement, pension, uh, great, team. great team, awesome CEO. So these, these types, and that's kind of how that's constructed to where you can get essentially an elevator pitch of why to work for your organization. I would contend that this elevator pitch should be at the top of every job posting that you have because at the end of the day, if I join an organization, yes, I'm joining for a particular job, for a particular position, but at the end, I'm buying into the organization and the hope is that I stick with that organization a long term and I'm gonna have different positions with that organization if I believe in it but it kind of starts with why I'm there in the first place, and then from there, I'll have growth and development. So some statistics about employer branding and doing a good job of employer branding, and these are uh, different places um, that I, I grabbed the, these stats, and I have a, a little flyer on my LinkedIn page if you wanna grab it, but with this graphic, um, 28%, with good employer branding, you have 28% reduced turnover, uh, 84% of um, candidates when making a decision on where to even apply for the job, 84% of them says the reputation of the employer is important. 79% of the job applicants use social media in the job search, and I'll show why this is important in a second. 60, we talk about millennials and Gen Z all the time, and I think it's a phenomenal case study for branding, uh, in employer branding, but 68% of millennials evaluate an employer brand. Um, and it really just enhances your organization. Now, public sector, you may say, well, how do we have a brand already? And aside from kind of the, the service, the public service of fire and police, we're talking about general, you know, state agencies, local agencies, things like that. There's already a brand out there. There's already an employer brand out there. And for good or for bad, right? It's, it's what is sort of, I'm sure you've heard it 
and it's the government employees work less, government, you know, the, the, the output isn't the same, not as innovative, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My experience in public sector is very much different than this. However, without providing a counterpoint and, a, and, a, and an argument in the other direction, this is the default brand that your organization would have. When we talk about police and fire, the reason why, and even law, um, the reason why there's already a brand is that of, of all the mass media, and in my household, um, I can't go a week without watching all of the Chicago's, apparently, the Chicago 911, the Chicago Fire, Chicago PD, all this stuff. And for better or for worse, whether it's accurate or not, you have these, these medical dramas, the police dramas, the fire dramas, the um, legal dramas, law and order. I mean, it seems like that show just doesn't go away ever. Um, but that creates a perception of what it's like to work for a fire agency. Now, individual, one fire agency versus another is a different, fire department versus another is a different conversation. And one, and rural police versus city police is a different, different whole job. But at least you have an expectation that you, when you walk into a firehouse of, uh, brotherhood, of, you know, camaraderie, um, and you know when you walk into police station kind of the the protection and calling uh, to service so it's already there and we can talk about little intricacies from there but if you think about individual departments within the state of california or a local uh municipality a lot of times the office type jobs just get kind of grouped in together as government Another example, the, the United States Army has um, an issue recruiting officers to the STEM program, science, uh, technology, engineering, and math. And as I was looking into uh, kind of what that means and, and why they're having that, that issue, I, I pulled up their website and these images are from the U.S. Army's website. And you can see the the uh, lady on the top. She's you know wearing the military fatigue, holding the test tube. And to me, I have a, a mental disconnect with it because if I'm a scientist, I feel that she just doesn't look like a scientist. It, she looks like a soldier that's playing with chemicals to me. And and if I'm a scientist. That's not speaking to me as science first. It may be speaking to me as a soldier that also has an interest in microbiology, but it doesn't speak to me as a microbiologist that wants to lend my talent to the, the military to help the greater good. The, similarly to the bottom uh, photo, we have these people playing with this robot, and it literally looks like that. Like, I, I mean, I... I look at it, it looks like you're playing with a robot. You're learning how to, how to operate this robot. These very well may be the engineers that built it, right? But it just doesn't feel like that. And so to me, the, the employer branding problem in this case is, are you identifying with the right candidate? And are you, is, is it right to sell military, soldier that happens to be an engineer? Or do you want the best engineers that want to give their talents to the U.S. Uh, military. And part of that is figuring out how we define that audience, right? It's so important. And this is a, um, an exercise that helps sort of evaluate who are we talking to and who is our ideal employees and, and what makes someone successful um, within our organization. And, we can do the, this is done in like uh, small focus groups, usually with senior leaders. And we talk about what the key employees from every division or every area within an organization, 
what really counts to them? Uh, what are they worried about? Um, what are people saying about their positions? What does their boss say? What do influencers say? What are their attitudes? How do they behave? What's their environment look like? And what are their wants and needs and what is success to them? So really defining almost that avatar of who are the target people that you're trying to attract for different positions or for the organization as a whole. And then what is the messaging that then will appeal to that particular group of people? So we get into this concept of the marriage of HR and marketing, and it's getting more blurred. Right, in, in that we're recruiting talent and we're figuring out who, um, who we want in our organization that, that are gonna kind of predict success and help us get to where we want to go with our overarching mission and vision um, that are also going to want to be there and, and build that positive uh, culture. And part of that marketing, that marketing marriage, in, in marketing, in the private sector, um, we talk about a marketing funnel or a sales funnel. And a sales funnel is you sort of build this, this huge list of potential uh, prospects to buy something, right? And uh, you build awareness of, of that widget or whatever it is. And then people start asking questions. Uh, iPhone, we build awareness for a smartphone. Hey, how does it work? What does it do? Et cetera, et cetera. As they start asking questions, they become qualified leads. Uh, Follow-up process happens. They, that person, is, the opportunity there um, is sort of, they're really thinking about buying, and then that becomes a purchase decision. In HR, it's very similar in that we look at casting a net to bring talent into our organization or interest into our organization from talent, that that talent becomes increasingly interested in our organization, starts looking into us as an organization, then decides to apply for a position and becomes a candidate, um, gets some interviews, becomes a finalist, and then gets hired. But it sort of the hires and the quality of hires is going to be based on the talent that we can attract at the top end. And that's why kind of this marketing aspect comes together. So two of the major players that I see in this space is, is Glassdoor and LinkedIn. And, and I'm not sure how many um, people are familiar with Glassdoor, but Glassdoor is essentially a, a review site for employers. And I think of Glassdoor a lot like Amazon. So if I'm looking for sheets on Amazon, I can pull up this search. And the first thing that I, I look at in this case, like, oh, the prices are pretty similar. And those pink sheets at the top, which have different colors if I didn't want pink or lavender, uh, have 327 reviews, but are four and a half stars. Now, those white sheets have five star reviews and are basically the same price, but it's only one person reviewed them, right? So I kind of take that with a little skepticism, right? And, and as all of us have done shopping on Amazon, We've looked at things, we've looked at reviews, we click on the reviews, and then we look what it, individuals are saying, and we're all smart enough to know that, hey, if it's a negative review, uh, but it's one person out of a million, you just had a bad experience for the most part. Those are, that's a pretty good chance that, that that's going to be a good buy. Glassdoor, this is a, a screenshot, and I just took the, screenshot of California Office of the Attorney General. Um, but this is an example of what is on their glass door. So you can see it's very similar, right? There's a star rating, three and a half stars, 87% uh, approve of the CEO, 81% recommend to a friend, um, great mentorship in the comments, 19 reviews, nine people posted salaries, four people posted news, 
not a lot of reviews given there's 5,000 employees. That's a little bit, that's a little bit off putting to me. Um, now your organization, maybe it's not a great culture. Maybe the culture is terrible. Maybe saying to all your employees, hey, go on Glassdoor and post a review is not going to be the thing that you want to do. Um, but it's awareness of what's out there and awareness of what people are saying about your organization, good or bad, helps you address those negative concerns because the goal is to make a better organization moving forward and things happen that are not great experiences to people but it's addressing those experiences and probably is not going to be with that particular individual but it's more of hey we're seeing a theme of whatever this is um the, we should make an initiative to do something about it but employees are uh, prospects are going to these pages to check out uh options i do it before i would interview for any position um to see to see what i'm in for the other one is LinkedIn, and LinkedIn is really powerful because as you interview and think about supervisors, this is my LinkedIn page and it's just recommendations that are on it. Recommendations are so important from a way of giving positive feedback to employees as well as um, sort of learning who you'd be who you'd be working for and and I actually looked up the LinkedIn account of my boss before I started at, at this job and saw that there was great comments and recommendations uh, given about her before I started my position here. So needless to say, when I interviewed, I was a little bit extra nervous because I thought this would be an awesome, awesome place to work and that individual would be an awesome person to work for. And that and that was before I even before I even interviewed, right? But some of the important things about your LinkedIn is it's a billboard not only for you personally and professionally, but for your organization, because as people look you up, it connects you with that organization. And that organization then comes off as having employees that are professional, put together, thought leaders, uh, et cetera. So things like professional photos. Are, are important and this section the articles and activity um, is it a, is an option or a really a, a jumping off point for anyone to create thought leadership uh, around who they are and what they do and and whatever that passion is that you have um, you know within the public sector service uh, you know protecting the environment fire uh, training, whatever that is. That being said, branding and, and all of this, um, how the messaging works is by humanizing your, your organization. And, you know, we, in theory, we have all of these feelings and benefits and flexibility and, and, and how all that works. But in practice, it, it comes off like something like this. And, 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 and this is, you know, obviously Kylie Jenner. Um, Kylie, you know, was recognized as what, a, a 21 years old, a, a billionaire, and is a phenomenal case study in this because I took these photos from her Instagram. I had to scroll down a little bit so that they were appropriate pictures. But uh, you can see that that you know top left is sort of this awful picture of of her her daughter and that awful meaning it's not like high quality. It's just sort of she took it right. And the bottom right is just a selfie picture she took in front of a mirror. Um, and then you have all these other beautiful photos that were professionally done that's that promoting her her makeup and cosmetic lines. But it's bridging personal with professional, and this is obviously on a on a consumer scale targeted at at millennials or Gen Z. Um, so it is a little bit bit more risque. But in in the corporate life and and public sector life, this shows up. LinkedIn is really the the methodology to promote it, and it shows up in posts like this which is, this is a nonprofit organization that I found um, just 
searching around on LinkedIn. You can see they have pictures here showing off they're, they're at a conference, having a good time, laughing. Looks like they enjoy working uh, together. This is the same organization um, providing an evidence of success. Uh, the, in this case, it says proud to be featured on the Northern Virginia Technology Council. And it's, you know, he's holding this map and he's happy about, you know, whatever it is he's happy about. But, but he, he, he looks like a fun person to, to interact with. And this is the same guy. And again, video, uh, I'm not going to play this video because obviously just in my PowerPoint here, but the, um, embedding video and more, um, candid type video that aren't produced without the green screen stuff and, and everything else, but that you get an, an indication of what uh, his personality is, is important because as you get a buy-in with leadership or, or your organization, um, it helps. So humanizing your organization. So things that you can think about, showing off your staff, uh, showing uh, the fun and relatable side of your organization, um, leveraging LinkedIn and, and kind of helping uh, brand your employees because they end up uh, branding your organization and turning into a promotion team uh, for you. Um, being authentic, true to who you are, and then leveraging your social media uh, strategy and messaging around that. So that's my employer branding, I guess, 101. Um, start, start to finish, I'll, I'll open the conversation up to any questions. Okay, great. And we do have a number of questions, and please feel free to continue entering your questions into the question panel in your webinar dashboard. First one we have is, how do you distinguish an agency from the industry perspective? How do you create an environment of individuality in your organization or for your organization? Yeah, so I guess, you know, we go back to the overarching strategy and a lot of the things that I talked about here would be starting with humanizing your brand, understanding what your target, what your target is and, and what are the channels and methods to connect um, with those, those individuals. A lot of times uh, between agencies, there may be some crossover, but uh, it's having your own voice and just staying authentic to who you are and, and, publishing that on a consistent basis um, so that there is that visibility into your organization. Great answer, thank you. Um, so here is a slightly different one. How would you get all of the departments in a company to market under one single brand when they have historically all had, every department has had a separate marketing budget and strategy? Okay, so in, in uh, this case, we kind of are more focusing on employer branding. That's probably a little bit into like product or service, um, service promotion. And that's, that's a tough thing. It, it really starts with the, the executive leadership and, and what is the overall uh, goal within your organization to promote uh, your products and, and how do all your promotion materials, uh, digital content and, um, and sales content work to, to create that message is everything kind of cohesive or, or piecemeal and you kind of have to step up um, top down to, to work through that problem but it's not necessarily so employer brandy okay um, and going in a slightly different direction someone wants to know how would you reach out and attract multiple generations with limited budget the cool thing about social media is that you don't need a lot of money, right? You, you, it's not, um, it's not incredibly produced. It's just consistency over time and creating a content calendar and creating an overarching strategy and then, and then implementing, um, implementing that, that particular strategy. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it can be as simple as creating different flyers and brochures for, um, for your job postings or rewriting your, your job descriptions, uh, that match individual target demographics. 
um, or you know it can, it can go as crazy as having professionally produced videos but really you don't need to go there okay thank you and the next question that came in is how can you get that internal buy-in when establishing the employer brand and you know I'm assuming that means top level and you know trickling all the way down through the organization yeah first the top level buy-in is um, you start with having the conversations and focus groups and and meetings around what the organization's goals are and what you're trying to get out of that that particular uh, out of the brand and and who you're trying to attract internally the best way to get feedback is to ask um, and and to get people to participate just like I did on this webinar um, having someone <laughs> express that you know bullying is top of mind and and overly being overly busy and and coffee is the first thing that comes up you know uh, which means it's probably going to be a busy day um, you know having that feedback and that collaboration within an entire organization and showing the importance from the top of the organization to really discover what the employer brand is so it can be one thing but then it kind of evolves and develops from there great answer um here is a whole different topic how do you suggest responding to negative reviews on social media related to your employer it's an opportunity isn't it yeah i mean i again those are great ways to learn about your own uh, organization and to be self-aware um, I typically when there's when there's issues I usually own them right and I it, it very well may be the case for that individual and to, to use it as an opportunity to learn and make sure that you don't have that same issue happen again uh, if there is a way to comment back within uh, that that review I would certainly do so and request that the that the person that left it uh, reach out to you directly and um, you know to to make the that statement that we're doing everything that we can to make sure that this this experience doesn't happen to any of our employees in the future. So you know you're not large organizations aren't going to be perfect with every employee, just like large companies aren't going to be perfect with every customer, right? So you're going to have some that don't have a positive experience, but it's about how you deal with it and, and how you can learn from it and become better as an organization that's important, not the fact that something negative happened. And a good opportunity to show that you actually care and are willing to address it. Right, because most, most companies wouldn't even address it, right? They would just, it would just be there. Okay, terrific. So we have someone else asking you to touch on employee engagement. Um, what what are some of the tactics you could use? So you know, employee engagement to me and, and branding, employer branding, kind of work together in that if you feel connected and culturally connected to your organization, that you're more likely to engage with your organization, right? You're going to be happier to be there, and then that sort of starts this whole um, this whole rolling downhill of of becoming more and more uh, of a performer at work right because now i'm i feel connected to my organization culturally i like being at work so now i'm more engaged so now i'm putting more uh, more and more effort in and i'm paying more attention to my job and i'm going the extra miles now the the uh, organization overall um is is better for it so it sort of works hand in hand also employee engagement we have uh you know, employee engagement surveys and, and all sorts of uh, products and services for employee engagement. And really the messaging, the messaging around the importance of employee engagement within an organization also has a brand component because at the end of the day, the whole reason why you care about employee engagement is you want to get the voice of your employees and you want to learn how to make their atmosphere better so that they have they have better quality of life and one way is through survey but if they don't respond to that survey then you're not 
really getting the voice of everybody. And so um, having that branding aspect to communicate the importance of those employee engagement initiatives so that the organization can actually make changes and, and uh, be better for it. Terrific. Um, here's another one asking, what do you consider to be the most important elements of employer branding? Um, the example is logo, tagline, mission, vision. But yeah, again, it's, that's yeah, it's, it's really about um, how an organization makes their employees feel and how connected you are within your your organization so that's uh where i feel that it it all it all begins and then um once you have that strategy and that demographic you know messaging that uh consistently okay and someone else writes in that they are a multi-campus college district uh where people tend to recognize the individual college names that nobody knows the district name, and they're wondering how to bridge that so that I guess the district is recognized and has a brand with all of the colleges underneath. Yeah, so I guess the that question um, really depends on if you're looking for recruitment, trying to recruit people into the into the district and using and using the district as a whole. Um, to bring talent in, or if you're talking about getting students into that into those colleges, uh, we'd have to delve into why, um, what what the problem is that we're trying to solve. Um, you know, I would I would say you kind of look at it like in colleges you have an individual college like USC or UCLA, and then you have Pac-12 as their as their athletic conference. Uh, does it it depends on again the problem that you're trying to solve. Does it make sense to even have that visibility of the Pac-12, or is it good enough to just brand UCLA or UC Davis or whatever? Okay, um, so here is someone asking if you can provide some good examples of how to increase organizational performance through the cult the cultivation of the brand. Again, it's really it's about that internal um, engagement and building up your um, your employees to where they want to they want to come to work and they and they want to do a great job and that in the end helps that that performance in general also helps you recruit um, recruit more employees. I'm looking at some other questions that came in. Any tips for government recruiting, specifically public safety? So public safety is definitely fun to uh, to recruit for. Um, it really depends on who you are as a as a public safety agency. I would say you have to take a step back first and understand who your top performers are and, and what their profile is, just like anything else. Like who are we trying to attract? and then have the conversation with those performers and, and really bring them into the fold on what is going to resonate with them specifically, like why, what attracts them to, uh, to their position, and go from there to create the messaging to find, um, to find that same type of, of candidate, right? Uh, on a larger scale, you know, when we do hiring events or, or things of that nature, um, I've used all the different social media channels uh, within, you know, CPS HR, and we've attracted hundreds, if not thousand applicants in, in three to five days uh, based, on, based on social strategies. But it's about placing yourself where the candidates are and then, um, and then sort of executing in, in a manner that they would they would engage with. Okay, so that's it for the questions. Um, I do want to thank you, Jason, for the terrific and very insightful presentation. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. As a reminder, Jason will cover this topic in more detail with Cecily Hastings from LinkedIn at the CPSHR Talent Management Conference 
in Napa this coming February. For more information on that conference, please visit the conference website at www.cpshr.us slash accelerate 2020. And with that, I thank you all again and would like to remind you that we will send an email with a link to today's recording and slide deck. And if anyone has any specific questions, you can feel free to contact me directly. Um, either email jlichney at cpshr.us uh, or again, connect with me on LinkedIn, message me. I'd be happy to, to answer any questions that you have directly. Thank you. Have a great day.